I want to welcome everyone here. I see some new faces, and that's always a wonderful thing. And uh, I want to say to all the dads, biological dads, stepdads, and spiritual dads, happy Father's Day. So if you are a father, spiritual dad, biological dad, uh, stepdad, would you please stand wherever you are right now? Just stand wherever you are. Go ahead and stand up. Let's give them a round of applause and praise God for them. Amen. Thank you for standing and thank you for just being the dads that you are. Um, I just am so grateful uh, for the spiritual dads uh, in, in my family, in my life. So let me just pray for you real quick. Father, I thank you for these dads that are standing. I thank you, Lord, for the commission that you have on their lives and the mission that you have for them to be a, a shining example of what you are like, our Heavenly Father. And Lord, we thank you for that privilege. I pray, Lord, just for a special encouragement and an inspiration and a challenge to our dads today. And so, Lord, we lift them up to you and thank you for them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So happy Father's Day. Uh, I know that uh, this, is a, this is a great day that we get to celebrate. Not sure uh, when Father's Day was started, but I want to thank whoever started it because, hey, I get all kinds of cards. I get breakfast in bed. And, you know, it's just a fun day for, for dads. So here's a story for you. No one could really say why he ran away. Paco found himself wandering the streets of Madrid, Spain, with the hopes of entering into a profession that would most likely get him killed. Bullfighting. He didn't care if he lived or died after his broken relationship with his dad that drove him to the streets. But that was the last thing his father wanted, and he longed for Paco to come home. He tried looking for him in the streets to no avail. He tried something in a last-ditch effort, which he desperately hoped would work. He put a, an advertisement in the local newspaper, and the advertisement read, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. Love, Papa. Paco is such a common name in Spain that when the father went to the Hotel Montana the next day at noon, there were eight hundred young men named Paco waiting for their fathers, waiting for the forgiveness they never thought was possible. A father's love. A father's love is the most important, it's the most powerful agent in the universe. It's what we desire the most. It's the most coveted merit badge we seek. To have our Father's approval and His love. Let me read you just a testimony from a a young man in, who lives right here in Southern California. And he wrote this. He said, my father was a successful clothing salesman who worked a lot. But even when he was home on weekends, he wasn't available. All of my life, I've suffered from uncertainties about my masculinity. I think it's because... He never shared anything about himself with me. He didn't tell me what 
kinds of problems he wrestled with, what he felt, or what it meant to him to be a man. I have, I've had to make it all up for myself. And I'm never sure I got it right. So today I want to talk to you dads in particular about the great impact you have on your kids. Your impact could be negative or it could be positive, but make no mistake about it, your impact is enormous on molding and shaping your kids. So I've titled today's message, The Prodigal God. Now before you shoot me with, when you say that's blasphemy for because you might be thinking that I'm saying that God is wayward. Uh, and that's not what I'm say saying. Let me explain. The word prodigal, yes, it does mean wayward. But what it actually means, extravagant spending and reckless spending. But it also has another definition. And that means having or giving something on a lavish scale. And in a story today, we find a father who bestows gifts onto a son that's undeserving. So when we read Luke 15 and the prodigal son, uh, we think about an ungrateful son who took his inheritance and he squandered it in a foreign country to the point where he had nothing left but the worst job in the world. Which, which was, it was the best job that he could get, which was feeding pigs. But in that story is another brother. It's the older brother who stayed home. And he was equally wayward even though he was at home. And the reason Jesus tells this story about the two sons is because his audience had two groups of people. So to know who these two groups are, we go all the way back to verse 1 and 2 in chapter 15 of Luke. And it says this, And now the tax collectors and sinners... We're all drawing near to hear him. That's one group. The sinners and the tax collectors. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So you see the sinners and tax collectors drawing near to Jesus, and then on the other hand, you see the Pharisees and the scribes who are judging the whole scene that's going on. Basically, what Luke is illustrating here is that there are really only two kinds of people in this story those who know. They are sinners in need of a Savior. And those who think they are good enough on their own. So it's in response to that that Jesus tells them, he tells them three parables. Sequentially, he tells them the parable of the lost sheep. And in the lost sheep, there are a hundred sheep, and he leaves the ninety-nine, and he goes to find the one. And then there is the parable of the lost coin, where there are ten coins, and the woman loses a coin, and so she tears her house upside down until she finds that missing coin. And then to today's story, we come to the parable of the lost son, or I, I say the lost sons. But the focus here 
to, for today is not really on the sons. We hear that preached and taught uh, often many times. What I want you to focus on today is the father. So dads, if you really want to know how to love your children, here is a great example. I want us to first focus on the younger son. Now the younger son, verse 12, he wanted to escape his dad. He said, Father, give me my inheritance. That is tantamount to saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. Because that's when the son got his inheritance was when the son or when the father was dead. He wanted his inheritance early. And sure enough, the father said, okay, and gave it to him. And then he squandered it. Verse 14 says he squandered all of his inheritance. And in verse 17, desperate for help, the Bible says he came to his senses. And in verse 20, we see that he humbled himself to return. We, see, we read in verse 20, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt, felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Notice the father's response in verse 20. But while he was still a long way off. This means that the father was looking for his son's return. The father who let him go is the same father who was waiting for him to return. He was looking toward the horizon, longing for his son's return. We see a father now in those days... Even though the father had many servants, he was regarded as one of the workers himself. We think of servants today as where we can sit out by the pool and sip on some iced tea or lemonade while all the servants do the work. But that wasn't the case in those days. In those days, if you were a father and you had a flock or you had things, you you worked alongside with your sons and with everybody else. But here this father, instead of working, was standing. I don't know where he was standing, but he was standing somewhere where he was looking over the horizon, horizon waiting for his son to come home. We see a father here that was not focused on his work, but on his son. Dads, can your kids, can they say that about you sometimes? That you are focused on your kids and not on your work. Is there ever a time where your kids have your undivided attention? Do they know that sometimes your focus is totally on them and on nothing else. So the father was looking for a relationship with his son, but that's not, not all. The father, it says in verse 20, his father saw him and felt compassion on him. He was deeply moved in his heart. Because he had been longing for his son to come home, and he saw his son. Now, Dad, let's face it. We, we dads, we have a hard time with expressing emotion. We really do. Except anger. I talked about this a few weeks ago. Anger is an emotion, and we have no problem expressing that. But some of the other we think fluffy emotions, we have a hard time 
expressing those, but you've got to understand something. Those emotions are God-given. It is man that tells you, it's really the devil that tells you through man and man's traditions that big boys don't cry. And we put away those emotions. We push them down so that no one can see those emotions in our lives. But dads, your kids need to see you embracing all the emotions that God has gifted you with. See, your kids need to know how to handle sadness by watching you. They need to know how to handle loss. They need to know how to handle defeat. They need to know how to work through all of those things, including victory. They need to know how to be humble, how to be strong. They need to know all of those things. And when we push down our emotions, we don't get to show our kids how to deal with those things. Now, here's a dad who had compassion for his son, and look at the reaction. He had compassion for him, which produces, produced a reaction, and in this case, he ran. I don't know if you've seen, like, old men run, but it's not a pretty sight. He ran. He ran after his son. He didn't stand there on the porch with his arms crossed and say, well, 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 my son has come home. Well, before you can step on the porch. Here's some rules I have. Here's some demands I'm going to make. You see, that's the kind of dads that many of us are used to. But this dad, he ran after his son and he embraced him and he kissed him. Now, I know, I know that in our culture, in the, especially in the Asian culture, we, we, don't, we don't do this a lot. We don't embrace a lot. But our kids, even when they're grown, even when they're teenagers, dads, our kids need to feel our embrace. They need our touch. Any tradition, any culture, any textbook that tells you that that's not necessary, well, that they are just wrong. It is the kind of wrong that comes from the pit of hell. It's Satan himself organizing cultures and structures to keep dads from embracing their kids and loving on their kids. Don't assume that your kid knows. Oh, my kid knows that I love him. Look at all the stuff that I do for him. Your kid needs your embrace. I never will forget the time when I got a knock on the door. It was in the early 90s, and it was one of the students from my youth group. Big 200-pound linebacker from the local high school. He said, can I talk to you? Now, I knew this kid. This kid was 
from one of the richest families in the community. This kid had everything that he desired. He had the best car. He lived in the best neighborhood. He had everything that he desired. His dad made sure that he took care of him with all of these lavish gifts. But his dad never spent time with him. And I remember as I held that 200-pound linebacker in my arms and he just wept like a baby. And he just kept saying over and over and over, why doesn't my dad love me? Why doesn't he love me? So you see in this dad on his reunifying with his son, we see in verse 24 and are 22 and following. He didn't have a list of demands. He didn't have a new set of rules. He didn't even let him finish his apology. Can you imagine this son? I don't know how far away he was, but he had a long walk home and he was rehearsing this apology. The whole way. He's like, I hope I say the right thing. I hope I have like a humble enough attitude that my dad will see that I'm a changed person. I hope he realized he had all of these hopes. And he was about to say, Dad, forgive me. And I remember his rehearsal was, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son but make me one of your hired servants. That was his speech. That was his apology. But the dad didn't let him finish. He says in verse 22, But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And celebrate they did. And on the other hand, you have the older son now. This was the, he was the good boy. He wasn't the black sheep of the family. He stayed home. He was obedient to his father. He obeyed all his father's commands. But he hears this party going on, and he asks one of the servants, what's going on? And they tell him that, hey, your little brother who ran away is now back. He became angry, and he refused to rejoice with them. He refused to join the party. He became jealous. So the father had to go out and he had to find him. And he had to encourage him and to comfort him. And he says in verse 31, he said to him, Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. Now this Here is a one-liner. All that is mine is yours, but it really encompasses everything that he gave the younger son. So the, the father's love for the older son was no different than what he gave to the younger son. Because his love was not based on what the sons did. They loved him simply, or he loved them simply because they were his Sons. But dads, I realize that some of you, probably many of you, you didn't, you didn't grow up with a great example. You didn't grow up with an example of, of 
what a father really looks like. Let's face it, us fathers, we make a lot of mistakes. I look at my three kids, and they're grown now, and they serve the Lord, love the Lord, and I, I know that it's not because of me. I know that it's in spite of me. I've made many, many mistakes. Because, you see, I, I didn't grow up in, in a home where I had a relationship with, with my dad. My dad was a tough World War II survivor. And he uh, ruled with an iron fist, metaphorically. It's actually a bamboo stick. <laughs> but I, when I came to faith in Christ, I wanted to break the chain. I wanted to break the cycle. My dad wasn't all bad. There were a lot of good things that he taught me. But loving my kids was something that I never learned from my dad. I learned that from my heavenly father. And I want to close with this story. This happened about 27 years ago. But it's as fresh as it uh, on my mind as it, as it was the day it happened. You see, every year at summertime, I would go to youth camp, and I would spend a week, Donna and I, we, we would spend a week at youth camp with these kids. And I had a business, an architectural business, which I left behind for that week. And I just, I just thought, okay, God, I'm down here uh, two hours away, uh, suffering for you with all these teenagers, middle schoolers and high schoolers. It's where I got all these gray hairs. You know that? And so I know that you're going to take care of my business. And I was expecting a, a large check to come in where I can pay my employees. So Monday, I'm at camp. I call my office, and I ask one of my employees, hey, did the check come in? And they said, no, the check didn't come in. And, in fact, the, the client is really upset with you and they're not going to issue the check until you come and talk to them in person. I'm like, come on. I got angry. I borrowed a car from a friend because I rode the bus down there, so I borrowed a car. And on my way there, I just, I was just kind of ticked at God. You ever been there? Yeah, yeah, do you know it's okay? It's okay to tell God that you're angry because, you know, he already knows. <laughs> Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? Right? He already knows. So I'm riding in this borrowed car. It's about a two-hour drive, and I'm on my way back so that I can meet my client in person. And I'm, I'm just, I'm upset. And I begin to converse with God. I begin to tell God. God, I'm angry with you. I am doing this work for you on this, at this youth camp, telling kids about Jesus, and you can't even take care of my business for me. What's up with that, God? And I just, I mean, I, I'm, I got to tell you, I just lost it. I began to cry and and I'm driving, and I know people probably thought I'm, I'm like on a suicide mission. I don't know what they thought. I didn't care. I began to think about my kids. They were little kids. They were little at the time. And I thought about them, and I thought about how they got everything. They got a roof over their head. They don't ever worry about what to eat. good school they have a mom and dad that love them pretty much everything they 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 want uh, it, it's 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 available to them they live in a loving family all their needs are taken care of and it has suddenly occurred to me i don't know what that feels like i don't know what it feels like to 
to be covered and to be taken care of. It's like all my life, it's like I've had to take care of myself. So I'm having this conversation with God, and, and I said, God, why, why can't I be somebody's little boy for a day? And then I said this. I said, God, I just, can I be your little boy for, the, for a day? What happened next was the most amazing thing. In this car was a cassette player. You guys, you remember cassette players. Some of us remember eight tracks. <laughs> cassette player. And unbeknownst to me, there was, there was a tape that had been playing all this time, but I was totally oblivious to it. But the moment that I cried out, God, I want to be your little boy, a song came on. And I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew that God was talking to me. You know what the song was? Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes were calling from glen to glen and down the mountainside. I tell you, when I heard that, I just, I just knew that I knew that I knew that God was saying, Son, you are my child. You are my child. I just need you to let me be your father. I'll tell you what, if I was crying before, I was really crying now. And I was just, you know, you have those cries that you just can't stop and then stuff is like running out of your nose and you don't care. Is that one of those great cries? And I was just praising the Lord. I don't know how fast I was going. I was just going up I-95. And when I came to my senses, I passed my exit by 60 miles. Dads, your heavenly father is your example. And that's the picture that Luke is recording. That's the picture that Jesus is painting in this story. That dads, your heavenly father is your example. Let's pray. Father, we... Thank you for this story. Lord, thank you for this example of this extravagant father who lavishes on his sons this incredible love and forgiveness. God, thank you for that. And Lord, I, I pray for all the dads in this room that, that they would grab hold of you and your word and to to have you as an example of a father. And that they would love their sons and daughters the way you love us. God, I pray that uh, in, in these families represented in this room, that you will break the cycle. That you will... Raise up dads in this room that will embrace their emotions. And they would lead their families. Lord, thank you for dads. Thank you for fathers and father figures in our lives. Lord, Give us courage to accept this challenge, to be the best dads that you have called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.